Welcome back, everyone. This is Brian with Faith on Fire. And in today's video, we're going to talk about salvation and the assurance of your salvation. So first thing we're going to do is we're going to hear a clip from John MacArthur. Now, this is about a four and a half minute video clip. I'm not going to be interrupting this time at all to make commentary. I'll wait to the end. So it's going to be four and a half minutes where he's going to answer the question from a, a lady in their church, uh, Grace Community Church. And her question is about her struggles with sin uh, and that, you know, she's um, actually a bit distraught about not really having the assurance of her own salvation. Now, in Calvinism, they believe in the doctrine of election, which means from the beginning of time, God already determined who would be the elect and who would be the non-elect. And we don't really know who those people are for sure. So they have this doctrine that outside of the, you know, total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, and irresistible grace, it it's all capped off with perseverance of the saints. And this is how those who are truly the, the elect will continue in faithfulness and good works, proving to the very end that they are actually part of the elect. And when people end up in reality struggling with sin in their life, though they believed on the Lord Jesus Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection and have been saved, they don't necessarily feel saved. But who cares about feelings? Feelings are stupid. But anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself. <laughs> we we stand on the word of God and what God says, and we can trust that more than our feelings and so forth. But there are those who have an, a different kind of an answer to about to the assurance of your salvation. And John MacArthur has some good points in what he's about to say. But overall, you'll see it's more about us than about Christ. And I don't believe in perseverance of the saints because I don't even believe in Calvinism and its doctrines. I believe in perseverance of the Savior. By his works are we kept saved, not by our own. Now, with that in mind, let's listen to John MacArthur, and then I'll have a few more things to say at the end. Here we go. The way you know that you are saved is by your desire. Do you desire to know God? Yes. Do you desire, do you desire that he would know you and love you? Yes. Do you desire to love him? Yes. Do you desire to honor him? Yes. Do you desire to obey his word? I do, but I, it, I can't do it on my own strength. Well, of course not. Join the club. <laughs> and that's why we're all here. This is the same with all of us. Um, it's all of grace, isn't it? It's all of grace. The Apostle Paul in Romans 7 helps us because this is the Apostle Paul. This is the, the one that we would elevate as the, su the supreme example of, of a Christian. And he says, um, well, he calls himself a wretched man because he says, I do what I don't want to do and I don't do what I want to do. Uh, he said, there is, a, there is a principle in me that loves the law of God, but I see another principle in me warring against the principle of my mind, and it's the principle of my flesh, and it causes me to do the very opposite of the things I want to do. And he says, oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from the body of this death? And that's, that's a very interesting illustration. And that very cry is evidence of the work of God in your heart, that, that you desire to know God, to be loved by God, to love God, to honor God, to obey God, and that you know you can't is a statement of a genuine believer because you recognize that you aren't everything you should be and you are utterly dependent upon God Himself and upon the Holy Spirit. That's true of your salvation. You can't save yourself and you can't sanctify yourself. So you're, you're where all honest Christians live. You, you're saying, I'm not what I, what I want to be, but I know what I want to be. I'm not what I ought to be, but I know what I ought to be. It's, it's about direction. It's about affection. It's about love. And we've talked about that recently. So you don't, you don't want to evaluate the character of your salvation by your failures. You want to assess the genuineness of your salvation by your desires, by what you love, what you long for, what you want. And you're here, and that, that says everything. This is not a, a place for people running from God. This is a place for people running to Him. But asking the question is important. The, the purest joy, to kind of play on your name a little bit, the purest joy in the Christian life comes 
when we are obeying Him, loving Him, serving Him, worshiping Him, that's when we enjoy the most assurance. Security is one thing. Security means that I am saved and He will keep me until I see Him face to face. I'm secure in Him. That's not assurance. Assurance is the confidence I have in my mind of my salvation. Many people are saved, they're secure, secured by God in that salvation, but they don't always have the assurance. Why do we struggle with assurance? Because we know our weakness, because we know our temptations, because we know we're not what we ought to be, sometimes because we fall into a pattern of sin and we lose our assurance, sometimes because um, perhaps we have been taught wrongly that um, you might do something that cause you to lose your salvation and that generates a certain amount of fear. But to go back to the main point, the very desire of your heart is the evidence of the work of God in your life because unregenerate enemies of God don't have those desires, okay? Does that help? Thank you. Thank you, Joy. All right, there's John MacArthur's take on that. So first of all, let me just recap before we go into Scripture and look at the real reason we are saved and have the assurance of our salvation. And I'll even throwing a bonus there, and I'll go through some Scripture and show you how uh, easily Scripture debunks the Calvinistic doctrine of election. Okay, but first, John MacArthur said that um, someone's desire is how they have assurance of their salvation. Um, well, uh, desire in what fashion? Like to love God, to seek God, to do things. This is the same person who in total depravity says that no one seeks God, no, not one, Romans 3. Um, but then when it suits talking about his own people in his own congregation, it's like, look how great you people are. Look how wonderful you are. You're, the fact that you are even here is proof of your salvation. I mean, did he not say that? That's what he said. Okay, no, you're not saved because you go to church. <laughs> and your desire to go to church and your desire to love God, well, you could say that that same desire exists in a Mormons or Jehovah's Witnesses or other cults and religions. They desire to seek God, but in a different way that's not true. It's not the true gospel. Um, some of the things that, that MacArthur said, it seems to be teaching that you are the one who you need to look. You need to look inward at yourself and your own motivations, your emotions, or your feelings, and your own desires to find out if you are saved. Introspectively speaking, you assure yourself well, let me just tell you right now, the, uh, the assurance of your salvation comes, number one, by the fact that you know why you're saved, because you know the true gospel. Number two, it's because it's the word of God that promises you that salvation, and God is not a liar. You can trust God. If you're a believer in the word of God, and you believe in the true gospel, what more do you need? It's that belief that is your faith. We are saved by grace through faith, right? And you've heard the phrase, saved by grace through faith in Christ alone. So if your faith is in Christ alone, believing on Him for your salvation, that in itself is your assurance because your emotions and your feelings and your desires over your lifetime will change. Can you imagine having to rely on ourselves for our own salvation and assurance of that salvation? We'd all go nuts. No wonder so many people who are in Reformed churches or in Calvinism in general are struggling with their assurance. And whether or not they're really part of the elect or not, well, I can assure you, they're not part of the elect because there's no such thing. There's just people who are born again believers in Christ that are part of the part of the body of Christ. They become members of the body of Christ as a result of them being believers, and they are given the the gift of grace. The Holy Spirit dwells them. They are sealed by the Holy Spirit. That's why you're saved. The elect, non-elect, get rid of those thoughts. The elect and chosen and chose those words in the Bible. They have real meaning, but it's not the Calvinistic one. That God, God loved this group so much that these sinners he chose to save and bring to heaven. But he also created in his image these sinners over here. And he just hates them. And he has reserved the lake of fire for them for eternal damnation. Now, that's not the God of the Bible. Not at all. So let's go into scripture and I'm going to show you about salvation, assurance of your salvation, and ultimately debunking the concept of unconditional election. So let's start in uh, 
in uh, where are we? Uh, we're in First uh, John chapter five, right? Not the Gospel of John, but First John chapter five, verse thirteen. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. And that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. Now, this is your eternal security right here. That you may know you have eternal life. How? These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God. If you've believed in Jesus Christ and his death, burial, and resurrection, the Bible says you're saved. Just read 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 4. Paul lays out the simple gospel of believing on Jesus Christ, meaning in his death, burial, and resurrection in which he conquered sin and death on our behalf, your behalf, my behalf. And we believe we receive the gift of grace, which is eternal life. There it is. So your assurance is not in how you feel. No, we're trusting in Christ alone. That's the, that's the, the good news of the gospel. And it's available to everyone. So this is important. And when we believe in the word of God, in God's word, over how we feel or what our desires may be, that's real faith. That's faith. That's the faith that walks by, uh, walks, uh, walks, I'm sorry, that's when we walk by faith and not by sight. But a lot of people want to walk by sight. And sight actually would include in this concept how I feel from day to day, maybe my emotions. Imagine someone who goes through a family tragedy. Sometimes their whole view and desires toward God changes in a, in, in a flash. They struggle. They go through a period of maybe being angry at God. The last place they want to go is to church. But when they had believed, they could be going through this season. And for some reasons, they may come out better and stronger than ever in terms of their spirituality and their faith. But in that season, do you think how much assurance do they have? Well, if they still remember what they had believed in and that come Whatever storm of life comes your way, that your faith was based upon believing the rock of Jesus, the firm foundation in Jesus Christ, our Savior, you will not get washed out. You will not get your, your faith is not on a shifting sand. The shifting sands would be like your works, your feelings, your desires. Okay, so that's all garbage. Don't trust in those things. Trust in Christ alone. Now, let's talk about the elect. Let me go into... The Gospel of John, chapter 1. Now, obviously, real quick, again, even though I said it at the very beginning, the elect are those that the Calvinists say God chose for salvation. He does the choosing, no one else does. They don't believe we have any choice in this. God predestined people to be either the elect or non-elect. Predestined, the word in itself implies predestiny. Your destiny is either in heaven or in hell, and God predetermined your destiny, okay? There's their doctrine of election. Now, some go even further than saying predestined or predestinated and actually think that includes every little detail of your life. God has ordained it all. He has determined every action you made. If you had a ham and Swiss cheese sandwich yesterday for lunch, it's because God determined it from the beginning of time. That may be considered hyper-Calvinism, but nevertheless, there's that, there, there's that whole scope. So many Calvinists, I believe, just believe in the destiny end of it. Predestined for heaven, predestined for hell. And in either destiny choice God has made for you, there are free will choices in each path that you could make. You could make free will choices on your way to hell, but you never could choose to become part of the elect. That's already set in stone. And you could be of the elect, and you could choose different free will choices along that path as well, but you will never be lost, right? Because you will always be... Uh, you know, in faithfulness and in good works, helped by the Holy Spirit towards that end of going to heaven. So there's there's that. Now let, let's see if the Bible says this is true. No, it, it obviously doesn't. But I'll, you know, spoiler. <laughs> but I'll go through it anyway, just so people can see it firsthand. Verse nine, Gospel of John, chapter one. That was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. The Apostle John is writing about Jesus here. In verse eight, he's actually writing about the, the John the Baptist. And then he goes on to Jesus in verse 9. He's the true light with light of how many men? Right. By the way, man here means mankind. It's, it's referring to men and women, right? It's everybody, which, including children for that matter, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. That's not just lighteth the elect. That's every man that cometh into the world. It's everybody. So let's jump over to John chapter 3, verse 14. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. 
Remember that when you read John 12, verse 32. Jesus said this, And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. How many men? Just the elect? Just some small group? All men. Well, then how come not everyone is saved and going to heaven? How come people are actually going to be on the highway to hell? You know, the wide road to destruction. Why is that so? Let's go back to John 3 again. Look at verse 15. Here's a great message, right? That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. There's your gospel message right there. There's the good news of the gospel for the whole world and everyone. In verse 6, everyone knows John 3, 16. I, I repeat it in so many videos. I'll, I'll, let's, I'll jump down to where I want to go regarding the light and people's choices. Here's 19. And this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world, that's Jesus, and men love darkness rather than light because their de deeds were evil, right? It doesn't say all men love darkness rather than light. It's just an end men, meaning people, men and women alike, love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. This proves that people are exposed to the light. They know of the light. They know Jesus is the light and they reject Jesus. They made a choice. They, they weren't, God didn't make the choice. Men made the choice. They chose the darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. And that's the way they liked it. It wasn't because they were in a state of total depravity where they have no choice. They have no way to possibly respond positively to the gospel. No, they hear the gospel, right? And they choose the darkness. And so that's it. In a nutshell, if I go back to John chapter 12, I could also read you verse 46. It says, I am come a light into the world that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. Whosoever believeth. So if you want to avoid the pitfalls of verse 19 back in John chapter 3, that those who love darkness rather than light, that's their condemnation. That's why they're going to go to hell. Then just remember in chapter 12, the same apostle John told us, Whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. That is a great promise. So if you believe this and you believe in Jesus Christ, you are saved. Think of Acts chapter 16. Do I have that up here? Acts chapter 16. This is very simple. Paul and Silas were in jail and the earthquake came and loosed the chains and opened the, opened the doors. And the jailer was scared. He was going to kill himself. But they called out and said, no, we're still here. And they were in the darkness. So that's why the jailer couldn't see them. And then he goes in, verse 29. Then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling. This is talking about the jailer, right? And he fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and hope to God you're part of the elect and thou shalt be saved. No, I, I threw something in there. I, I, I not, can't add to scripture. Let's just say what it says. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and thy house. And what did Paul and Silas do? They go over to the guy's house and everyone of the household hears the gospel and they all get saved because they believe and they get baptized. It's a wonderful thing. It's the believer's baptism. That is a model, by the way, throughout Scripture. That's what we should be doing. After you are born again, you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Next step really is uh, baptism. Sometime, but, you know, is, is baptism going to secure your salvation? Even that? No, it's the belief. How do we know that? Let me tell you uh, where, else, where else I can show you that. Obviously, the thief on the cross did not get baptized. He believed on the Lord Jesus Christ next to him, right? But... You know, Jesus said, you'll be with, to, with me today in paradise. We're, there was no time for this guy to get baptized. But look at the Great Commission in the Gospel of Mark. And it said, he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Some versions of the Bible say condemned instead of damned. Now, what is this saying? You got to believe and be baptized? Remember, it's saved by grace through faith in Christ alone. Let's not add anything to it. This is not Mark adding to the gospel. Notice he's clarifying how you are not going to be saved. It's all based on just believing. Notice it doesn't say, but he that believeth and or is not baptized is going to be damned. It's only he that believeth not. So if you believe, you are going to be saved. Shall be saved. But as a believer, you should be baptized too. And that is, that's a model we see. And so uh, with that, I think that's pretty much all I wanted to share today. The kind of, uh, let's see, is there any other Bible verses I got? I, got, I do have more up on the screen here, not seeing, but I'm not sure if they're, 
there, uh, what I was going to share here in this video, I guess I already read this. This let's go, let's go back to where I began with verse 13. The assurance of your salvation is entrusting the word of God is true and that you can rely on because he said, uh, all of heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. So even though we change, our emotions change, our feelings, our desires change, if we have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, it is written that we are saved and we have eternal security. And verse 13 says, and I'll repeat it again. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. Who can have eternal life? Anyone and everyone who is a whosoever. Who believes on the Lord Jesus Christ shall not perish, but have everlasting life. That is a beautiful promise. And that's the good news of the gospel. There's no good news in Calvinism. No, I, ha I hate to say it, but there's not even good news for the so-called elect because they're just delusional people caught up in a religious elitism of man-made philosophical doctrines. They're not even true. So if you put your hope in being part of the elect, and that's what you're striving for is evidence whether it be from desire or your emotions or the fact that you go to Grace Community Church or some other Reformed church or Calvinistic church or maybe it's just a Baptist church that's that's Reformed or something like that. And they're teaching the doctrine of election. You think, yeah, I'm part of the elect. I've got news for you. No, 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 not at all. That doesn't exist. <laughs> You're putting your trust in the wrong thing. Right. You know, so well, there's one other thing I wanted to show you real quick. Which 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 verse was it? Oh, my, oh, my, my, my. Um, Mark 16. Okay, I'm going to put Mark 16 on the screen. Last thing I want to show you. I already read it, but I, I, I did not pause to say what I wanted to say in verse 15. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Now, we know God is not a liar. Jesus is God. Jesus is not a liar either. Jesus gave us this command, commandment. If you read Acts chapter 1, Verses 4 to 8, you will see another version of this, the Great Commission. The Great Commission is in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But it's also in Acts chapter 1, verses 4 to 8. And it's the last thing he commanded us before going to heaven, is sending up into heaven. Now, I can assure you, Jesus did not tell us to lie on his behalf. Jesus is not lying to us or anybody. But if you believe this right here, as a Calvinist who believes in a doctrinal election, you cannot believe this. You cannot believe verse 15 and a lot of other things in the Bible. You may tell yourself you believe the word of God, but you do not. You flat out deny it. Because if you believe this at the same time believing in the elect and non-elect, then you believe Jesus is asking us to lie on his behalf and go out to every person in the world and tell them the good news of the gospel is that if they believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, they shall be saved, knowing full well that most people, that promise doesn't apply to them at all. God is not going to save them no matter what they believe or think because he's already chosen them as vessels of wrath to send them to an eternal punishment in the lake of fire. That's what Calvinists believe. That's why it's dangerous. That's why people should thoroughly debunk it and walk away from it and leave all the churches that teach it. It's just an infiltration into the Christian churches and Bible colleges and seminaries that have fundamentally changed who Jesus is and who he came to save and the entire gospel into a different gospel. Be warned, they don't believe in the true gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's a sad thing. And if you're listening to this and you're starting to steam up because you're a Calvinist, you go to a Calvinist church and you think it's the greatest thing and you think you can prove it in the Bible, no, you cannot. You're deluding yourself. You are part of this great delusion of the end times. Now, you need to wake up and you need to put your trust solely in Jesus Christ who will save you and make you new again. And then the Holy Spirit will indwell you and start to teach you wisdom and truth in the Word of God. And you'll see the truth and you'll see that the good news of the gospel is available to everyone because God loves everyone everyone in at least this much if not in other i mean in agape love is something we can't even begin to comprehend and it talks about that in the bible but the fact is his god is at least in this much towards everyone i said i wasn't going to repeat this bible verse but i'm going to do it to end it john 3 16 for god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever shall believe on, on him shall not perish but have everlasting life there is no greater love than that 
of the Savior of Jesus Christ for all people that he's made a way. All they have to do is believe and trust in him rather than in, in themselves. What better news could there be? And Calvinism denies that for many people. And they're wrong. And anyway, hope this helps. Hope this is edifying the body of Christ. I'm praying for everyone to receive the truth in this word. And for those who are in Calvinism to come out of it and just start to begin to trust the word of God and not in their religious system. That's man-made philosophies. All right, thanks everyone for watching. And may the peace and love of Jesus Christ be with you now and forever. Amen. Bye-bye.